and putting students together with farmers, graduate students in this case on the, on the right, you know, sharing information about some aspect of the farm and getting perspectives from both sides so that they learn together. And one of the things we've done as part of our nonprofit is sponsored a, an annual intensive two-week agroecology course. And the 16th one of them is happening this summer in Santa Cruz in July. And you could actually get academic credit for that course through the University of Vermont, where we have one of our partner organizations uh, having set it up now so that you can, you can do that. And there's a place to get information about that course. Now, that's all the training piece, but I wanted to jump real quickly into a, another issue. This just came out in the paper this last week. It kind of shows Hotel California, which is kind of the capital over there on the left, a dry groundwater system. And over there, I heard this in the news a few weeks ago, you know, we're facing a, catastro a catastrophe, experts say. We've only got enough water for one year. And if we don't take drastic steps, we're done for. And of course, what's one of those steps? Reuse your hotel towels, please. Is that where the real issue needs to be solved? When 80% of the developed water of California is used by agriculture? and it's used by an agriculture that's not sustainable, and it's used by an agriculture that until legislation was passed last September in Sacramento calling for the establishment of sustainable groundwater management plans, if you own the land, you own the water, or had access to as much as you wanted as long as you used it, quote unquote, for beneficial purposes. Well, that meant agriculture. And over the last four years of the drought, and especially since that legislation was passed, it gives people five to seven years to come up with those management plans, and meanwhile, it's business as usual. Unless you're a county like Ventura County, which passed a moratorium on new, new wells, until that plan's in place. But they're one of the only counties in the state that did that. All the rest of them, you get your permit, you drill your well. And the, the deeper your pockets, the deeper your well. And there is a rush to the bottom going on in California right now that has the potential for sucking this state dry in a few years, especially if the climate change that's being predicted continues as it is. Well, what's the solution? Well, you know, you drive across the San Joaquin Valley and these signs say who caused the problem. Uh, not agriculture, that's you know, Congress. You know, we're starting to get into the politics of food systems, the politics of water, the place where supposedly change happens, right? And you think about this little spot in the Cuyama Valley of northern Santa Barbara County, 50, 60 miles east of Santa Maria on your way to the San Joaquin Valley. Farming in the desert, an area that probably has, especially the last several years, less than three or four inches of rain a year. And they're growing water intensive vegetable crops, especially carrots. Probably, what did I read? 20,000 20, of the 60,000 acres being grown of carrots in the, in the Cuyama Valley uh, are organic. And the water they're using, based on a USGS groundwater study that was just completed this last summer for this area, a five-year study showing in the last 20 years groundwater depletion and subsidence of the, ground, of the groundwater system has accelerated and is accelerating year by year based on this agriculture. Well, something has to change. And right now the critical factor is gonna be water use in conventional agriculture in California with the trends in climate that we're seeing happen now. But it's gonna require some real different some action. And I think maybe a way of thinking about this is our own personal action, our own farm in the Cuyama Valley, not too far from those big organic over-irrigated carrot plots where we have a 20 acre farm. We're growing five acres of, of uh, grapes and olives. Robbie's the pruner of the, the, the olives. I prune the grapes, although we share it back and forth, but it's, it's a family affair. We're off the grid, everything's solar, including a little pump in the well. But what we're doing is dry farming, an old traditional practice still used in most of Southern Europe. In fact, there are places in Southern Europe where it's illegal to irrigate because it changes the quality of the grapes and hence the quality of the wine. And a dry farm grape produces a different kind of grape and a different kind of wine. 
and it uses, even though you can see we have a little backup drip system on every plant, that we use mostly to simulate rainfall when we don't get it. And boy, for the last four years, we haven't been getting it. Uh, so we've had to add some. But even when we do that, we use probably about 5% of the amount of water that a conventional vineyard will use. It's a real different system. Uh, you can see they're just creating the dust mulch. That's what it's called, actually. A dry layer of soil that we cultivate after the last rains, and it creates a barrier between the moisture in the soil below and the air above. It's like pinching a straw. It breaks capillarity so that water can't pull on the column of water, and it seals the water into the soil. But you need to get rainfall in the wintertime to recharge that water, and that's been the challenge for us. But you can see the, the traditional head-trained, freestanding plants rather than on wires. Again, the old traditional practice. Learning from, from the old traditional ways of planting and adapting it to today. And our harvests are community events too, where we have lots of former students and friends and family and everybody else pitches in. And, and then our main sales point is the farmer's markets in Santa Cruz and uh, our little wine club and stuff. And there's three generations of us. And uh, this, is, this is where the key piece is gonna be though, uh, making sure that the passion that Robbie and I have for doing this gets picked up and carried on by the, by the next generations. And I think my, our son and his wife are mostly just busy raising the family and paying the mortgage, but hopefully we'll get Mateo out there running the show. Something to think about. I want to throw this at you. Buckminster Fuller, kind of a, a pretty radical architect, used this philosophy in his design of new architecture. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's in a sense where I think agroecology is right now. As we develop this incredible network of small farms, and you've heard about some of them, and, there, and, and different kinds of market relationships, a, a relationship-based direct connection between the grower and the eater, and, and a whole understanding of how important food systems are, not just for the people who grow the food and eat the food, but for our planet, in terms of how those landscapes provide so much beyond just the food that comes from them. So expanding our definition and giving it more of that action orientation where it's really participatory action and change that brings sustainability, security, and resilience to all parts of the food system, the ecological parts, the economic parts, and the social parts. Now, that means, of course, agroecology is a science. Agroecology is a practice. and it's a social change movement. Now the ideal agroecologist is doing all three. Now that might not be possible for everyone. I mean, we're lucky, I think, in the way our sort of connection to and immersion in agroecology has developed so that I really have been able to do all three and I keep trying to do them. And it's in seeing it, you know, kind of defending it and creating it as, a, as an approach to bringing together this network of knowledge of different ways of, of doing, thinking, and being in a food system, gosh, agroecology gives us that background. So you really need to have all three to be agroecology in the way we're thinking about it. And I think all of you are in a unique position knowing now that you have this tool called agroecology and where you can insert yourself in the food system and create the change from being a grower to being an eater. They're all parts of the change process. And spreading that out and creating a network of support for an alternative set of policies and moving it up then through the system that creates change. I think you can do it all. It just needs a commitment and action and a vision for doing it. But at the same time, we're in a, we're in a crazy time. <laughs> It's a bit freaky with this wireless technology, you know, what's, what's going to hold us up? You know, we were so dependent upon the old way of doing things, the conventional way of doing things. We're really moving into something that almost is unknown, but it's really known. We just have to reinvent it and reapply it. So kind of my vision for agroecology as a global movement includes components like this, where it builds a diverse multifunctional system. It ensures food security, sovereignty, choice and justice. 
It supports this local food movement. It respects local knowledge that goes along with that local food movement. And it especially empowers women and youth who too often are excluded. And e ecologically, economically, and socially, these systems are sustainable in all of these areas simultaneously. It's gonna favor small and medium farm systems. And I expect in some of the questions following this, we'll have a chance to explore that a little more. But I know that if I were doing much more than five acres, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> 